As ASEAN celebrates its 50th anniversary, what economic and regional accomplishments has ASEAN achieved so far and what developments can we count on in the next 50 years? And as security hotspots continue to threaten world peace, how can the United Nations do a better job in preventing conflicts in the future and where does China fit in the scene? I'll have an exclusive interview with the new UN Under Secretary General for Disarmament Affairs, Itsumi Nakamitsu. Welcome to The Point, I'm Li Xin. The Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, is celebrating its 50th anniversary in the Philippine capital of Manila this month. Since its founding, the organization has emerged as a means of showcasing a new kind of regional unity and increasing the prosperity of Southeast Asia, despite enormous economic, political and cultural diversity among its member states. ASEAN has become a shining example of regional integration with great vitality and potential. What has ASEAN achieved during the last half century and what's in store for the next decades? Joining me today for the discussion is Professor Rong Ying, Vice President of China Institute of International Studies and in Singapore, Dr. Tai Wei Lim, Research Fellow at the National University of Singapore East Asian Institute. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Professor Rong, economic integration tops the agenda of this year's ASEAN Summit. Now, considering the huge gap of ASEAN states in economic structure and uh, competitiveness, uh, plus political and cultural differences, national cooperation could be an enormous challenge. Uh, how would you evaluate ASEAN's role in boosting regional economic integration during the past years? Well, uh, I think the, uh, there's a very uh, good book recently published by uh, Professor uh, Kesho um, Makabani and the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew Institute of uh, Government. And he, the title of the book is ASEAN Miracle, uh, Catalyst for Peace. And he, in his book, he argued, I think, uh, uh, forcefully that given the achievements uh, of ASEAN for the past 50 years, I think ASEAN deserves the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. So I think in, in this is, a, I, I, I believe, it's a very fair an objective assessment of what ASEAN has achieved. For me, I think it's two things. One is peace. Look at ASEAN uh, 50 years ago. There, literally, I think a lot of them, uh, they had a, there were conflict, wars, and various kind uh, of uh, problems that disturbing the region as a whole, but also cause big problems among themselves. And the second word is development. The past five, uh, five decades have held ASEAN the whole become now in the, uh, the seventh largest uh, economy combined with 2.4 trillion uh, 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 US dollars. So I think, uh, uh, to, of course, there are problems, there are challenges ahead, but to be fair, I think ASEAN uh, deserves the title of the most dynamic uh, regional uh, organizations uh, uh, with great potential. Dr. Lim, as ASEAN countries and China advocate a free trade, a mistrust of free trade has uh, recently been the, uh, on the rise. I mean, last week at the APEC summit, U.S. President Donald Trump uh, clearly attacked free trade, saying it costed uh, millions of American jobs. It seems that more and more nations at least are talking about more protectionist tone, uh, which is contrary to ASEAN's belief. How will ASEAN address this problem? I think uh, ASEAN is a beneficiary of uh, free trade and regionalism. It has been a beneficiary for the past few decades. Uh, first, uh, I amongst the four tiger economies, uh, included one ASEAN country, uh, Singapore. And then there were also a rising tiger and uh, dragon economies like Thailand, Malaysia, and, uh, and, and much later on the Philippines. And now we have the CLMV uh, uh, countries that are taking off as well. CLMV stands for Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, and Vietnam. So I think in all, uh, each member of ASEAN is a beneficiary of free trade and they want to keep it that way. And that's why in December 2015, ASEAN has quietly formed uh, the ASEAN Economic Community. But of course, after that, uh, ASEAN is aware of the anti-globalization uh, forces in, in the world, uh, symbolized by uh, movements like uh, Brexit and also uh, the uh, uh, 
contents that you've mentioned uh, about uh, U.S. concerns. And so all these anti-globalization forces has actually forced uh, this year's uh, APEC host, Vietnam, uh, to say that uh, globalization and economic regionalism should have a more inclusive uh, uh, kind of face to it. It should include more people, benefit more people, and to spread uh, digital uh, skills to en enable more uh, sections of the population to catch up with the rest that have digital skills and also to promote more free trade instead of less of it. So I think the main challenge and also the main direction that ASEAN countries like Vietnam wants to take is to work towards a more inclusive globalization 2.0 mm -hmm. to handle industrialization yeah. 4.0 yeah. to equip people, people with the skills necessary to handle the future. Yeah, well I think that is also why when President uh, Xi gave the speech uh, and when he talked about uh, how to make uh, development benefit uh, everybody in the region, he got a warm round of applause. Now in sharp contrast to US policy, uh, President Xi Jinping defended free trade and globalization saying we should support the multilateral trading regime and practice open regionalism. Now uh, Professor Rong, as the biggest trading partner of ASEAN and what role can China play and will China need to play in helping ASEAN realize trade liberalization across the region? Yeah, China is the uh, largest uh, trading partner of ASEAN and China has always been uh, strongly supporting the effort of, for, for a free trade and more open and inclusive uh, growth in the region. And uh, as uh, the, at the recent, I think, the, uh, the summit meeting between uh, uh, ASEAN and APEC, President Xi made it very clear that uh, as uh, ASEAN as the uh, most uh, dynamic uh, uh, regional organization in the region and there are a, a, a bigger role, bigger role actually ASEAN can play by working with, uh, with uh, uh, APEC and of course China included. And China, uh, uh, look at China's inter economic interactions and engagement with ASEAN, I think made it very clear we are going to upgrade a uh, so-called 2.0 uh, version of China-ASEAN free trade. And I think that is going to play a role, uh, I mean help to lead the effort to us more integrated, more open and more inclusive uh, 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 free trade uh, and multilateral mm -hmm. so that it would benefit mm -hmm. uh, all the countries in the region, China and ASEAN included. Mm -hmm. Now on Sunday, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang, as we were seeing there, arrived in the Philippines to attend the ASEAN summit. This was the all ASEAN business leaders meeting. This was the first time in over 10 years for Chinese Premier to visit that country. With uh, various agreements uh, on the table, uh, Dr. Lim, how could significant progress in China-Philippines relations uh, maybe set an example for other countries in the region in settling dispute and deepening cooperation? China-Philippines uh, relations have enjoyed uh, upswing since uh, President Duterte uh, took power and uh, both countries have met uh, regularly and uh, the leaders seem to be able to know each other better and so I think uh, this augurs well for overall uh, relationship uh, between uh, China and the Philippines and it, it could also have spilled over to a relationship with a uh, good relationship with uh, ASEAN. Uh, China is a very important uh, player uh, in integration and regionalism because it's most important uh, economic uh, diplomatic policy is the Belt and Road Initiative. At the very core of Belt and, and Road Initiative is the desire to build infrastructure to increase connectivity between countries including countries within uh, ASEAN. And Philippines is trying to tap uh, into this connectivity uh, initiative and that's one reason why uh, they are able to uh, uh, sort of extend economic cooperation with China. And besides Philippines, of course, uh, Indonesia is also working with the BRI projects, uh, uh, high-speed railways. Let me come back to my studio guest here, Professor Rong. Let me ask you about China's relationship with Vietnam, which is also very important and uh, another important stop on Chinese leaders' uh, visit here on Sunday. Chinese President Xi Jinping actually arrived, arrived in Hanoi, Vietnam for a state visit. So, uh, uh, what kind of uh, opportunities uh, are the two countries looking at in developing their relations in the new era? Oh, indeed. I think President Xi's uh, state visit to 
uh, Vietnam was very successful. I think it, is, it took place in the context when China has just, uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party has just uh, successfully concluded the uh, 19th uh, Party's Congress, which uh, formulated and uh, set out, I mean, a, a, a strategy for the next five years to, for China to uh, achieve that uh, 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 moderately better, I mean, prosperous. Uh, 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 society in you know, all respect, and uh, remember the uh, both China and uh, and, uh, and Vietnam had adopted a kind of a, a socialism, socialism, say socialist system. But they also, I think, uh, which uh, also keep in mind that they have to uh, be, uh, take into account the, uh, their own national uh, conditions. So both China and Vietnam uh, had also pursued a program of reform and opening up. So there are a lot. A lot uh, they can learn from each other, help from each other. I think the recent vid the, the visit uh, by President Xi uh, has uh, further, I mean, uh, consolidated that kind of consensus. But more importantly, I think the two leadership has agreed to work out our blueprint to further implement and pursue a, a kind of a good neighbor relationship and for common development. In the meantime, I think they also understand that there are some problems, there are some issues that they need to properly handle. But this is again uh, very much in the, in the uh, I think, uh, in the agreement. I think uh, they are, they were, we are very, I think I'm very optimistic about the relationship in the years ahead. Well, thank you very much. We have to leave it there. Professor Ronging, Vice President of the China Institute of International Studies and in Singapore, Dr. Tai Wei Lim, Research Fellow at the National University of Singapore. You have been watching The Point with me, Liu Xin. We'll take a short break and we'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Escalating regional uh, hotspots such as the one in the Middle East this week raises new questions about the most effective way to establish peace and security on a global scale. With Saudi Arabia and Iran in a standoff, a continuing crisis in Syria and the nuclear threat on the Korean Peninsula, how are international organizations such as the United Nations tackling disarmament and security issues? And as the UN is undergoing structural reform since the new Secretary General Antonio Guterres took office, what issues have been taking center stage and what progress has been made? I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Ms. Itsumi Nakamitsu, the United Nations Under Secretary General of Disarmament Affairs. Ms. Nakamitsu, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank Let's you. Let's first talk about the United Nations. I mean, uh, exceptional contributions have been made by this organization since the, uh, in the past 70 years. However, we are far away from achieving the goals we wanted to achieve. Now, as I said, um, Secretary General Guterres wanted to p push for reforms and he p took uh, bold steps. Uh, what progress has been made so far and uh, what is still lying ahead? Well, thank you for having me. Well, Secretary General is very keen to um, adjust the United Nations to a new environment and new challenges so that we can continue to make necessary contributions to the international crisis and, and resolution of those crises. Um, I should probably say that we are you know, on our way. It, it is a, a work in progress. But in the peace and security area, um, the Secretary General has launched his reform initiatives. Um, to look at how you know, the UN is making contributions to you know, peace, and peace operations in general and how prevention can in fact mm -hmm. take a center stage. What um, specific measures has he proposed or has he you know, launched? Well, he is going to be um, discussing with member states uh, his proposal or proposals on the uh, restructuring of the secretariat entities mm -hmm. um, so that we can, in fact, um, you know, make our peace operations more effective in terms of our operations on the ground. But also, as you remember, the Secretary General has actually said that prevention is the priority for the United Nations. 
um, you know, today, once the crisis or the conflict starts, yes. it is so difficult to resolve. So it's much better, in fact, to, to make sure that they will not happen to start with. So a lot of efforts are being That's put right. there. But it's very difficult to prevent a crisis. I mean, if it is simple, I guess people would have already started doing that. What do you think is the biggest challenge uh, in making prevention work better, especially in disarmament affairs? Well, disarmament, in fact, everything we do is for prevention. Uh, first and foremost, um, prevent, um, you know, disarmament measures, in fact, contribute to um, reducing the tensions um, and, um, and, you know, give, uh, if you will, breathing space uh, mm -hmm. for different actors, different countries to, um, to try and find, you know, dialogues and political solutions to, to, to be actually the, the way for resolving conflicts and, and disagreements. Um, but also, if there is, in fact, unfortunately, a conflict starts, then, you know, we contribute, disarmament actions, in fact, contribute to minimizing, if you will, the, the human losses. Mm -hmm. So everything we do uh, contributes to prevention uh, and the prevention agenda. Um, you know, this region, um, Northeast Asia region, uh, is actually looking at one of the most difficult sure. crises, um, most um, difficult tensions. Yeah. That and you also see. came into office on this, uh, at this That's very right. crucial period of time. I, I don't know how, how you, you have been feeling about your new job. I mean, where have you been putting most of your energy in and uh, what is the most challenging part so far? Well, there are many different types of things that I, that I deal with on my daily work. Um, of course, the DPRK crisis is something that we are watching very carefully. Uh, we have internal discussions um, on almost on a daily basis. Um, you know, our position is very clear on DPRK. First and foremost, we support member states in terms of, um, you know, the implementations of various Security Council resolutions. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one good thing about DPRK crisis is that the Security Council has been maintaining its unity. Um, this is something that gives us a clarity in terms of um, the way forward. Uh, we work to, to make sure that member states have a capacity to fully implement um, those resolutions. Uh, and then the Secretary General has been repeating um, many times that the crisis can only be resolved through political solutions. Uh, there can be no military solutions mm -hmm. to this crisis mm -hmm. uh, and we stand ready to support uh, member states to, um, to find ways into um, dialogue and, and negotiated solutions. Yes. Another very Im important issue that we have been talking about on the disarmament front is, of course, the Iran nuclear deal, yes. which um, became more in the news recently as the United States threatened to uh, tear up that uh, agreement. Um, from your perspective, how do you think, how do you evaluate the importance of this agreement? And if it is to be torn apart, what could be the potential consequences? Well, we certainly hope that it would not be torn apart. Um, we believe firmly that it has, JCPOA has in fact become a very important and integral part of an non international non-proliferation regime. So as such, uh, we are calling for all parties to, to remain committed mm -hmm. and, and fully implement uh, the agreement. Uh, we think it is absolutely critical that all parties in fact um, be um, fully committed and, and that would mean that uh, we maintain uh, the health, if you will, the strength of the international non-proliferation regime itself. Yeah, but do you understand the, the concern of the U.S. President Donald Trump? And if he insists on withdrawing from this, I mean, what, pro what work is being done to talk to him maybe to, you know, talk with the U.S. administration, current administration, about the, the potential con negative consequences of mm -hmm. withdrawing? Well, I mean, one thing is, uh, is that um, it might be misinterpreted that dialogues and political solutions don't mean anything by, you know, some of the, the other ongoing crises such as uh, in DPRK. Um, so, you know, we are calling for all parties to remain committed. And the good news is that I have heard 
so many countries, including China, but also all other countries um, emphasize the importance of uh, maintaining the JCPOA as mm -hmm. a, a critical part of a non-proliferation regime. So I think, um, you know, there is a, a very strong international consensus that this is an important deal. And after all, it is not actually a bilateral agreement. Uh, there is a Security Council resolution under Chapter 7. Yes. Um, you talked about the role of China and I think um, right now uh, emerging countries such as China is uh, playing and maybe it's ex also expected to play a greater role in peacekeeping and disarmament. How do you evaluate China's work so far and where do you see China's role uh, expanding or more active in the future? Mm. In many different areas, um, I actually did a lot of different things in the UN. I used to be in a uh, peacekeeping department for many years. And I've seen actually China um, become uh, more and more important and, and larger contributor of peacekeepers into peacekeeping operations. And, and we were very happy about that. I visited uh, the big peacekeeping training center just outside Beijing uh, mm -hmm. a couple of times when I was working for peacekeeping. Um, and then I, when I was in development, I was in uh, UN development program, UNDP, uh, I saw how China came up and then really um, pressed for this uh, very important uh, um, you know, framework called uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, and, and played a critical role um, in you know, putting together that very important framework. Mm -hmm. So you know, we welcome China's um, commitment to multilateralism and uh, support to different parts of the UN's work. Um, this is a, a very welcoming uh, trend that China has brought to the international scene and then we certainly hope that it will, be, uh, it will continue to be so. Uh, in disarmament areas, um, I find myself um, working very closely with Chinese government on, on many different files including, for example, on the Sierra chemical file, mm -hmm. uh, chemical weapons issues, um, DPRK crisis, of course, um, as well, um, and, um, you know, more sort of a broader um, disarmament uh, issues, including nuclear disarmament um, and conventional and, and small arms and, and, and light weapons disarmament areas as well. Um, increasingly, also, um, what we call frontier issues, science and technology development, impacting on international security issues. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another area where we work very closely with the Chinese government. Yeah. So in multiple dimensions Indeed. of um, work. Sure. We work. Well, I think it's in China's interest as well, right, mm -hmm. to, to, to progress actively on this issue. The latest um, um, meeting of the first committee of the 72nd UN General Assembly adopted two resolutions mm -hmm. connected to outer space or yes. arms race outer in outer space and uh, China's concept of building a, a mankind of shared destiny uh, is incorporated in these files. Right. Wh what do you think of that? Why is that idea in line with what the UN has been uh, advocating as well? Um, well, because the UN is all about, um, you know, member states actually getting together and then try to find common grounds and then move forward um, in terms of uh, making sure that the, the you know, peace and security will be maintained and collectively search ways to, to have a prosperity de that development. Mm -hmm. So, you know, definitely China taking a very strong position uh, to make sure that multilateralism and the solutions uh, at the UN place uh, will be there. That's a very welcoming thing. Um, yeah. we, we hope to be able to work, continue to work with the Chinese government very closely. Another very important uh, um, endeavor, let's say, you mentioned is the agenda for sustainable development, yes. altogether 17 goals. What are the connections there between these 17 goals and disarmament? There is something called Goal 16, and more precisely Goal 16.4, which talks about, uh, in fact, um, you know, having a better control and regulations on small arms. Um, you can imagine if uh, small arms are uncontrolled, unregulated, 
um, and illicit trade of those weapons are, um, you know, growing, mm -hmm. there will be, you know, greater risks of those small weapons, for example, you know, ending up in uh, the wrong hands, non-state actors. Uh, and we see that um, in places where these things, these um, weapons are not regulated sufficiently, um, economic developments are hampered. So there is a very strong uh, linkage. In fact, uh, those issues are integral part of the SDG, and, and therefore we want to make sure that disarmament will be taken by also um, national governments more seriously, and then we work to help those national governments so that they will have a better capacity yeah. to, to what about control. Yes, what about weapons on, on a larger scale? We're talking about nuclear disarmament, we'll talk about uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. Um, I understand in the disarmament conference, the negotiations has been stalled for years. Yes. Uh, what is being done to jumpstart that progress? Yes. Nuclear disarmament is something that we have been working on, in fact, as, as early as, um, you know, the first General Assembly, um, which was um, in 1946. So it is a founding part of the UN's work. But as you say, um, the progress, in, especially in, in, in you know, recent years, uh, 20 years plus, um, we have not seen a lot of progress. Until this year, um, earlier this year, there was uh, um, a new treaty that was adopted uh, by a group of uh, member states. Uh, it's a prohibition of uh, nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I was that following that story. Yes, that <laughs> was very controversial. The member states are yes. divided. What we say as a message to various member states is that um, there is that new treaty, but there is actually a cornerstone of nuclear disarmament called uh, NPT, yes. Nuclear yes. Weapons Non-Proliferation Treaty. And we are in fact in the, in the middle of a review cycle. Uh, in 2020, there is a review conference of the NPT. Uh, that is a very important review conference, and we need to make sure that the conference in 2020 will uh, end up in a success. Um, which will mean that uh, nuclear weapon states will make a visible progress in the disarmament commitment under the uh, Article 6 of the NPT. Mm -hmm. So there is a way to, in fact, uh, make sure that nuclear disarmament can also move one or two or three steps. Yeah, but ahead. aside from the multilateral, very briefly, last question, aside from the multilateral negotiations that have been going in the right direction of disarmament, uh, the United States, uh, yes. President Trump has been talking about more nuclear weapons, researching and mm -hmm. developing more nuclear weapons. What kind of um, potential uncertainty is that adding to the picture? Yes. So we say that uh, because of those modernization efforts, uh, in fact, we might be beginning to see a new arms race um, in terms of qualities, perhaps not quantity, um, the, the number of nuclear arsenals have gone down considerably um, compared to the, the, the Cold War, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, these uh, new efforts for trying to, to um, modernize weapons, yes. nuclear weapons, is a great concern to us. We also say that um, you know, more than 90% of nuclear arsenals belongs, belong to, in fact, uh, U.S. And, and Russian Federation. Mm. So these two largest nuclear weapon states have a special responsibility to make sure that they are engaged bilaterally to, to, um, to um, arm, you know, better sort of arms control and, and, and also arms reduction discussions. We hope that they will take up those um, uh, responsibilities and then make sure that disarmament discussions will continue and have uh, some outcomes as well. Daunting challenges, but uh, a lot of um, bravo and cheering <laughs> from all of us <laughs> for a successful term as the UN Under Secretary General of Disarmament Affairs, the first woman, I understand, to take up that post. No, there was actually one before, a woman <laughs> okay. before. Yes. But still, um, all the very best for the future. Many thanks for coming to our show. Ms. Itsumi Nakamitsu, the UN High Representative for Disarmament Affairs. And that is it for this edition of The Point with Mili Shane. Thank you for watching. Download the, the application called CGTN Live to watch our show on your mobile devices or go to YouTube and look for CGTN The Point. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.